All right, we're here on week three of the Striper Season Update brought to you by West Marine. Uh, a lot's changed this week. We're starting to see some migratory stripers hitting southern New England. Uh, actually, last week when we posted the update, we got a few emails in of people saying they'd already seen some fish with sea lice on them in Buzzards Bay. And then within a couple days of that, on Martha's Vineyard, the first migratory stripers were, were reported by Larry's Bait and Tackle on, it was April 11th, which was last Sunday. It's a little bit earlier than usual, but still within about, you know, maybe five or six days of when you usually hear about those first migratory fish in Massachusetts. Uh, we've got Kevin Blinkoff here again. I swear we're going to get some new guests eventually, but uh, for now, we're, we've got Kevin. Kevin, did you hear anything about Rhode Island and Connecticut in terms of where their striper migration is? I have heard some rumors of fresh fish showing up in Rhode Island, but it's tough to say at the moment because I also am hearing a really good holdover action. And that's something we can talk about a little bit here today is what's the difference between a holdover and a fresh fish. We have seen definitely, though, fresh fish, like you mentioned, a few of them popping up around um, southern side of, of Martha's Vineyard, also in Buzzards Bay, and definitely western Long Island Sound. Seems like some pretty good schools of fresh schoolie stripers moving into western Long Island Sound. Yeah, and of course, what we didn't mention is the striper fishing in Jersey continues on. They've still got great action, predominantly in, in the uh, Raritan Bay. But uh, Captain Brett Taylor, who writes our southern New Jersey fishing forecast every week, we put it up on Thursdays, said that the bass action is starting to spread out a little bit. You're starting to see some fish creep up from the south. Those might be Delaware Bay fish. I don't think we're seeing the Chesapeake fish just yet. Yeah, most of the reports right now, and it's a little tough because there isn't a whole lot of fishing allowed right now in Chesapeake Bay as these fish are spawning. But there have been some reports of sites of striped bass spawning. Um, when they do spawn, it's up inside freshwater rivers. It happens kind of on the surface, uh, so it is something that you can see and observe. And we've had reports of that happening lately. I think we just had a new moon, or we're at the new moon right now, and I think that could be part of the reason why we're starting to see some spawning action. So when a striped bass spawns, the way I understand it is you have the larger female that has all the eggs, and that'll swim toward the surface, and that kind of indicates to the males that are, that are there, the smaller males, that she's about to release her eggs, and the males will release the milt. And... Um, you know, they do that at the surface. A striped bass's egg is not neutrally buoyant. So it sinks a little bit. That's why they need to spawn in rivers. They need enough flow to make sure that that egg remains somewhat suspended until it hatches. Otherwise, it could go to the bottom, get covered in silt and suffocate. You know, different from a trout, how a trout would spawn in a river where it makes a red. And, you know, trout spawn over gravel as opposed to muddy bottoms in these tidal, tidal rivers where stripers spawn. But... You know, I didn't want to talk too much about striper spawning, but Kevin said it's getting underway in the Chesapeake. So once those fish finish up, they're going to be heading our way. And that's when the, the sea, things really, uh, really ramp up. Anyhow, living up here on Cape Cod, it's exciting to hear about those first migratory fish just showing up here. But next week, I'm planning to head down to Jersey and hopefully encounter some of those larger fish that are, that are swimming around down there at the you know, Monmouth County and Raritan Bay. So this time of year, when you do have the holdover fish getting more active as the water temperatures rise and some fresh fish arriving from the south, a debate among some new, uh, southern New England anglers is, is that fish they're catching a holdover or is it a migratory fish? Ultimately, it doesn't matter. If you're catching a striped bass, it's great. But seeing those migratory fish is a good indication that the season's really starting to ramp up. But Kevin, what is one of the ways that people determine whether that fish is a holdover or a, or a migrant? Right, right. So just to back up, a holdover fish, that's the idea. There are some some striped bass that will stay through the winter in southern New England and in Long Island and places like that, In typically in backwaters, in fresher water. Um, they tend to get pretty slow. Their metabolism slows down. So they look for places that have a little deeper, slower, fresh water where they can they can just kind of hold through the winter until they start to get a little more active again as it warms up in the spring. So Yes, it's great to catch a holdover striped bass is, is great, but there's something about that first fresh striped bass, that first schoolie you catch of the season that lets you know, okay, this is the start of the migration. These are the fresh fish. My season's really starting. So this time of year, we'll have somebody who'll go out and they'll catch a striped bass and look at the fish and try to say, okay, is this a holdover or did I just catch my first fresh fish of the season? Sometimes it's obvious. Um, a lot of times a holdover striped bass, because they've been in fresh water, they tend to have a little bit of a darker color to them, um, maybe more of a, you know, not quite so bright and shiny. And so and that could be because they've been inside of mud, kind of muddier, uh, darker water. Sometimes they've had a tough winter. They look a little beat up. They might have a little, um, you know, frayed fins and things like that. But another thing that people look for on these fresh fish is sea lice. And 
Sea lice are basically a parasite that appears on striped bass, especially in the spring. It's a small copepod, so that's actually a type of crustacean that is adapted to live on a fish and eat the slime, nibble at the skin. Um, and the sight of sea lice on a striped bass, many fishermen look at that and say, okay, this is a fresh migrating fish. I know it because it's bright, it's shiny, and it's got sea lice on it. They're kind of tannish, brownish in color. They're very small, and they're pretty much harmless to the fish, wouldn't you say? Like you said, they eat the slime mainly. They're not causing a lot of damage to the stripers, those particular ones. Yeah, they're they're parasites, so they are you know feeding on the striper, but it is kind of a battle. A healthy striped bass um, can usually deal with sea lice, a sea lice infestation, and and you know they have an immune system that can fight back against them. And sea lice will live on the striped bass for a certain amount of time until then they move on to the next phase of their life cycle, leave the striped bass, and go on and and continue their life cycle. So the only time that sea lice start to become a real problem is in situations where a fish is already in bad shape or unhealthy, it could add to those problems. It's a big issue. This is a little bit off topic, but it's a big issue with salmon farming. When you cram together a lot of salmon inside a pen, um, they're kind of sitting ducks for sea lice infestations. You've got a lot of them all in one space, really crammed together. It's kind of unnatural. And so it can be a big problem in fish farming operations. But when it comes to wild migrating striped bass, it doesn't seem to really affect them so much. Um, But for us, It's something we look at and say, okay, this fish has sea lice, so we think it's a a new arrival, it's a migrating fish. And the main reason for that is because these sea lice, they seem to have adapted to perhaps striped bass in particular. So there's many many different species of sea lice. Many of them are adapted to feed on specific fish species or group of fish. So the sea lice you find on salmon are probably not the same species you find on striped bass. So... Sea lice, they're they're planktonic, so they're free in the ocean for part of their life cycle. And it seems like this particular species of sea lice is um, adapted so that around this time of year in the spring, when striped bass are leaving and migrating through the ocean, they come into this part of their life cycle, they attach to the striped bass. um, And that's one of the reasons we see so many this time of year. The other reason is that these sea lice are adapted to an ocean environment. So they don't survive in fresh water necessarily. So if you have striped bass that have come through the ocean that have been in salt water, that's why they have the sea lice on them at that time. Once they spend some time in uh, brackish water and slightly fresh water, like most of these holdovers, holdovers have been doing, uh, the sea lice don't survive. They drop off. So that's why when the fish first arrive, these striped bass, sea lice is a pretty good indicator. This is a fish that has been traveling through the ocean that has picked these up out in salty water. Yep. And they are far from the only parasite that stripers get. I found a a study from the 70s that said that identified 45 different types of parasitic organisms that stripers can get on them. I mean, some of them are worms. A lot of them are nematodes. There's actually one where, you know, the, the, the animal will create cysts in the striper's flesh. So you go to fillet it and it looks like little peppercorns in there. That sounded really gross. I was itching all over reading all this, uh, this stuff. But. Yeah, fish in general, and, and they have a lot of parasites, can take on a lot of parasites. Um, I used to, in a, another job, I used to work at a, a big aquarium, and I sat in on a meeting once where one of the aquarists was talking about setting up the touch tank for children, and they were talking about with, um, you know, if you've ever been to an aquarium that has a touch tank, and you've got maybe stingrays with the stinger removed, and things like that swing by, and the kids get to reach in and touch them. And he was describing all of the different parasites that could be on these stingrays that the kids are petting and how many of them could cause a problem. Say if a kid pets a stingray and puts his hand in his mouth, some of them could transfer. But moral of the story is, yeah, fish take on a lot of parasites. And the other moral is, I guess, don't make sure you wash your kid's hands if you take them to a touch tank. The sea lice we're looking for on stripers can't transfer to people. Um, That's nothing you have to worry about, right? Uh, I don't think so. I mean, they are a little creepy if you look at them. Um, one difference between like a, you know, you, you know that they're sea lice versus like, say, a leech or something like that, because you can actually see them. They they aren't attached to the fish. They're more like a suction cup holding on. But when you pull that striper out of the water and you look at the sea lice, you can see they do kind of skitter around on top of the fish. They can move around. And um, really, that's what they do while the fish is swimming. It's all about for them trying to stay out of the turbulence and find a place that they can be flat against that fish so that they don't fall off when the fish is swimming. Yeah, that's why I see them near the near the fins and the tails, not necessarily on the fins, but kind of near them, places where it's not going to be uh, too much water resistance. 
Right, exactly. So so if you've never noticed them before, you're going to notice them now. Take a look at that first fish you catch this season and look closely and you'll see these little sea lice scampering around. This is different from this is different from the kind of lice that gets on your hair. These are nothing that could really affect you, but uh take a look and if you see those sea lice, it's a good indication you've caught your first migrating striper of the season. So different from these copepods Kevin's talking about, there's another type of, you know, people call you see something on a fish, you kind of call it a sea lice, sea louse. Uh, and these are actually, instead of copepods, they are isopods, and they're a little bit bigger. Uh, and I've only seen them from New Jersey to Maryland. I haven't seen them in New England or even New York. And they tend to be on fish in the backwater, so I don't think they need the high salinity that the uh, copepods need. So these parasitic isopods look more like kind of a sow bug or a pill bug that you would see in the backyard. They look just like that. And unlike the copepods, the sea lice Kevin was talking about, these will actually latch on. They'll let, and they are, they're, they're not just eating the striper slime, they're drinking its blood. So if you remove them, sometimes there's a little sore or a wound there where that fish was attached to the bass. Those ones really give me the heebie-jeebies. One, because they're a lot bigger, you can see the eyes on them, and uh, just because of the way they get, get stuck on the fish. But we caught uh, a beautiful striper in a, on a shoot in South Jersey with Tom Z of Simrad Electronics, and it had one of these enormous uh, isopods on its fin. But, you know, ultimately, it doesn't do the isopod any good to kill the fish. So as long as there's not too many on it, and the fish is in relatively good health, it's not going to adversely affect it. Now, there is also another type of isopod, as long as we're just trading stories about gross parasites on fish. Um, and these, I'm sure we can find some pictures of. I have never seen it on striped bass, but I've seen it before many times on fish further to the south, um, snappers and groupers, definitely. This is an isopod, again, like a pill bug, but picture one that's maybe about two or three inches long that I've seen that goes inside the gills and into the mouth of a fish and actually eats the tongue on the bottom of the fish's mouth and replaces it. So you look inside the fish's mouth, its tongue is gone and it's been replaced by this parasitic bug that lives there. Um, that's about as gross as it gets, I think. Yeah, I can't imagine lipping a fish and seeing something looking back at me in there. Yeah, so hopefully we'll never see those on striped bass up here, but definitely common down south, uh, like I said, on snappers and groupers. Um, so anyway, gross world of fish parasites. That's great. That's uh, By the time we're talking next week, I think there's going to be a lot more reports of migratory. Definitely, fish. definitely. We're seeing a little, better, a little uh, better weather. Hopefully after this weekend, things start to warm up. We're getting close in a lot of places to that kind of that magic temperature of about 50 degrees at the surface. So once that happens, it seems like that's when the fish really start to show up. So looking forward to it up here and pretty jealous that you're going to be heading down to New Jersey next week and getting into stripe, some striped bass fishing down there yourself. I'll send you some pictures. So oh, thank you. Thank you for watching our third installment of the Striper Season Update brought to you by West Marine. We're going to be putting one of these out on our YouTube channel every Friday. So make sure you subscribe. And also check out onthewitter.com where we post our striper migration map also on Fridays.